going to go ahead and just get started and as people trickle in it'll work out just fine. Well we're coming to the end of our sermon series Summer on the Psalms so uh, I'm hoping you've enjoyed that and that's been a blessing. We're going to be in Psalm 84 this morning and that'll be a lot of fun. Next week if you come to this service you'll be here early for the 10 o'clock service because people are leaving today some of them for the camp out. The rest of us are leaving on Thursday for the camp out and then if you are not planning on camping but you want to come up to Sugar Pine Campground up at Tahoe on Saturday night for um, a potluck and then for a worship service, we would love to have you. You can come out earlier too, go swim and hang out with people, do whatever you want to do, um, except feed the bears. Um, don't feed the bears. Um, and, and don't have any, actually, there's, you can't do anything you want to do. You have to listen to the rangers. I shouldn't have just said that. It's an open-ended option for Lutherans who would love grace and freedom of will. But you can come out you can have dinner with everybody, have a worship service, but if you're not going to be able to make that happen on Sunday, next Sunday, August 11th, we are going to be having our single service Sunday. Say that three times fast. And that's at 10 o'clock. So everybody's going to be coming together. We're going to have a traditional Lutheran worship service. And if you're not familiar with that, um, I pray that as we continue to do these once in a while, like four times a year, that you'll start to learn some of that tradition that's brought us to this experience and expression of worship so that we can be connected and experienced through the generations that have gone before us as they are still being handed down in these traditions. So that's a lot of fun, and it's a great time to come together. You'll get to use the hymnal, and you'll get to learn what a hymnal is and how to follow along in the call and response and the chanting and all that stuff. You get to see me wear my white dress and my stole, which will be a lot of fun. It's called an alb, but just for ease of practice. So, uh, other things on your yellow sheet. There's lots of things going on here at St. Luke's. Things that you should make a note of and be aware of and plug into your schedule. Uh, the other thing we're going to be doing at the beginning of our service is we're going to be bringing all the teachers and children getting ready for school to come forward. And we're going to be praying over them because it's an exciting season for them to get started once again. And so kids, be ready to move and teachers as well. And when I say kids, anyone going to school. So if you're working on your doctorate, still come forward. We'll still support you in that. Exactly. Or, or uh, graduate studies. That's exactly my point. And that means you, Andreas. That's exactly, yeah, he's nodding his head because he's a doctoral student, so that works out perfect. Anyway, I'm going to invite you to set all those things aside because we're here to be the body of Christ, to celebrate and to worship together. So I invite you to please rise, to extend a hand of welcome to the people around you, shake some hands, introduce yourself to somebody new.
We begin our service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And together we join in confessing these ancient words of faith that have been handed down through the generations that still hold us together in this church and through the churches around the world. We find it in the Apostles' Creed this morning. So we confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and now I'm going to invite all those educators and students to come on down. Yeah, just we'll just create a space here. We'll stay close. Wow, there's a lot of them. No, we'll stay close. We'll stay close because we're going to do like the laying on of hands. Kids, come on into the center. Yep, that's perfect. Come on in. If any of you would like to come forward and lay hands on these as we pray for them, it's a tradition and a practice of the early church throughout generations to lay hands uh, on missionaries and people that God are sending out into the mission field and make no mistake to train kids up and for kids to go out with their peers and to continue to learn and grow is a mission field. Dude, we have two educators from Sierra Lutheran High School who are sitting in the back. Man. Sierra Lutheran High School is the only high school in our district, in California, Nevada, Hawaii, and it is in Carson City. Uh, so we're very excited about that as well. We're going to be having one of those Sundays to show. So perfect. You lay on hands. Perfect. We'll pray. I'll go ahead and pray for everybody. You guys can lay, put, put hands on each other. Put hands on each other's shoulders. They're all in for the kids in the middle. That looks nice too. Okay. We're going to pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and Lord, we thank you for the season of rest that you've given us over this summer. But Lord, we look with joy and anticipation, even some nerves possibly, at this coming year of school. Lord, we ask that you would bless these educators, that you would give them patience, and that you'd give them keen minds and skill to be able to help teach these children and help develop them uh, in their character and in their, in their personal lives as well. Lord, we also ask for each one of these students that you'd give them peace, that you'd give them endurance, the ability to continue to work hard and give them minds of, of, in, of thought and, and good ideas that they can present as they look to grow in their education. But Lord, I ask that in all these, that in, above everything else, that you would present your love through each of these teachers, through each of these learners, Lord, that they would be a beacon of love to the people around them, that they might know your love through their experience. Lord, in all of these things, I ask that you would be ever present, that you promise that you'll be with them wherever they go, and that you would use them to share your gospel love with the people around them. According to the blessings we have in Christ's name and by the power of your spirit who works within his church. Amen. All right, go in peace. Serve hold on, that hold Lord. On. Don't go back yet. So, so the children and teachers, we have a little gift for you. It's a box of crayons, and it says, go out and color the color the world, but always remember God loves you for being you. And so just as every single color in this box of crayons is different and unique, you are also different and unique, and you're the only you there is. So we want you to go share God's love with everyone and have a little gift from us. So come get your box of crayons.
invite you to please rise as we continue our service with our next song. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing we have in him. You may be seated. Kids are going out today for, where's Mary? She must be getting ready for this. So I think kids are going out today for uh, faith fundamentals. So that'll be great. So we're going to send out the littlest kids here in just a second. But before you go, um, I realize as I've been talking to people um, that Many of you think that being a pastor would be fun. Um, I, my, my son has talked about wanting to be a pastor. I heard another kid say he wanted to be a pastor because then you could spank people. So that's awesome. 
Uh, just to be clear, I don't do that if you come in for confession. No Hail Marys, no corporal punishment. Um, actually, it's a great job because uh, the reality is that you're a professional Christian where you guys all get to do it like amateur style. So I don't have to worry about another type of job, and I only have to work one day a week. So kids, study hard, go to the seminary, and be pastors. With that, I'm going to invite the little children to please rise. They're going to head out for Faith Fundamentals, I think. Yep. Levantense, por favor. Yep, come on down. I got an 11 o'clock service, so we can't wait forever. I'm assuming so, right? Yeah, we do. Come on. That's what I get told. But one of the challenges, (laughs) that's the long dramatic pause. One of the challenges is that when you move across the country, you leave the place where you've been raised, and God calls you to any other place in the country. So my first call, even though I was raised in the Midwest, was down to Georgia. And then Brittany and I prayed, and we're like, okay, we're never going to take a call further from our family because we're 12 hours away. And then we moved to Reno, and now it's 27. But you're far away from your home where your family is, and normally that's not a big deal. Sometimes that's more of a blessing than a curse. But during the Christmas season, it gets tough for me. Now, Pastor Mike has been doing this for 40 years, so he's got way longer of working through this process than I do, but I've still missed it because I've been doing this for like 10 years from Vicarage on to now, and so I haven't gotten to go home and do the family Christmas for about 10 years. It's sad. Pastors, for the people who aren't kind of paying attention, uh, we work one day a week, and then we work holidays. It's kind of like the opposite of a government employee. They get all the holidays off, like it's, you know, flag day, let's take a day off, but then they have to work the rest of the week. So the problem is I don't get to go do any of those holidays with my family and with my friends. Christmas, Easter, those big fun ones are times where I'm working and Brittany is working. And I don't typically notice it until about two days before our Christmas Eve service when the stress is really starting to mount up and the anxiety. And I'm like, okay, I wish I was back in the car with my family driving towards northeastern Iowa to go back to the farm, to go ice skating on the Wapsie River in the middle of the night, to have my grandmother's cinnamon rolls and my, my aunt makes cookies for like six months. Um, so we spend our whole Christmas season grazing, much like the cows outside of the house, <laughs> in form and practice. And we just, we love that time. We laugh, we play card games uh, till late at night, and we tell stories, and we do all kinds of fun activities. And it's hard when you can't go home and spend those times together with the people that you love. So I yearn for that at that time. Now, it's gotten a little bit easier because my grandmother passed away five years ago. And my uncle, who was responsible for six of our people, um, like six of our family, they moved to Australia eight years ago. So it's, it wasn't going to be the same as it was anyway, which we all kind of know how that happens when you go home. But do you ever yearn to be back where those traditions are held, back where the, the family is, and back to have that time together with them, to feel that love and that joy of being together, to feel that presence and peace of just knowing that this is where you belong? You ever feel that? That is the heart of Psalm 84. That is the heart and the desire of the psalmist as he pens verses 1 and 2, all the way down through the whole thing. But verse 1 and 2 of Psalm 84, it says, better is one day in your courts. Nope, that's verse 10. Do I not have any of those? Oh, <laughs> how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. He speaks about the nature of being far away from his home, far away from the place he loves. And just the idea, if I could just be back in the presence of God, back in his temple where sacrifice can happen, where I know that I'm at peace with God, my creator, and from him comes strength and endurance from this life for wherever my journey leads. If I could just be there, I would know that I'm going to be okay. That's the same feeling an Iowan gets when he's with his family, because to be with family, you know it's going to be okay. These people have my back. But it's not always the same way. You don't always feel the same feeling when you go back home. 
We just spent uh, our summer, we did a little bit of touring, and we went back to all these places that I grew up. My dad was in federal law enforcement, so we moved every four years. And have you ever gone back home only to find that it's completely different than you expected? And you start to realize that life actually kept going on, even though you remember it just a certain way, that those cornfields that you saw like next to your house are now filled with subdivisions. And all the places where you used to go eat or, or, or shop are now closed down and they've put something else in its place because it's moved to a new building and everything's changed. And that can be very, very nerve-wracking, very uncomfortable because you're like, where, where could I possibly go now? The psalmist talks about being in the presence of God and being in his temple as that place. But there's a problem there's a problem. See, next summer we're going to Jerusalem. We're going to the Holy Land, so if you want to get on that trip, watch. It's going to be awesome. But we're going to go to Jerusalem at the end of the, uh, the 10 days, and we're going to be in the city. And you know what we're not going to get to walk into? The temple. There's a big golden dome where that temple was. Right? The Dome of the Rock. The, 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 the Muslim temple is there where, where Solomon's temple and then um, Herod's temple uh, is. And you're not going to be able to go into that place and be in that presence. I can't imagine what that would feel like to see the, the, the vision of a place and not be able to recognize that you're actually there any longer. When you think of the city of Reno, right, you think of the skyline of Reno, what are you looking to see so that you know it's Reno? That ball, right? The huge ball. Somebody draws that ball in the skyline, you're like, that's Reno. When you think of San Francisco, what do you think? What do you expect to see in the skyline picture that they draw? Exactly. When you think of Chicago, Sears, Sears Tower, yeah, that's good. New York, okay, now shoot it back 20 years ago with the World Trade Centers. You expected to see those two huge buildings, and then it's gone. Can you imagine the discomfort and the fear of wondering, is God really with us when we no longer have what we saw and knew for him to be there any longer? It can be very scary. This is where Jesus starts teaching. He starts in Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 42. He says, The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment of this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So we had this woman who came up because she heard of the wisdom of this Jewish, this very small kingdom's uh, ruler, their king. And so she came to hear what he had to say. And Jesus is saying, this woman is going to judge these people because they keep looking for a temple where they're going to meet God. They are going keep looking for a place where they're going to find peace in his presence. And the reality is for all of Solomon's wealth, for all of Solomon's wisdom, even for Solomon's temple, the first one to build the temple, something better than what Solomon had to offer is here. And in John 2, Jesus explains as he says, I'm going to tear down this temple and I'm going to rebuild it in three days. And then he says, that, well, the gospeler says, Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. That same gospeler who wrote John, John, uh, the disciple Jesus loved, also wrote Revelation. And at the end of Revelation, he sees the end times, how this is all going to unfold. And God took him up on a big hill in Revelation 21, a big mountain, and he showed him this new Jerusalem as it was coming down from heaven to be with his people so that God could be with his people forever. And he was looking at the skyline of Jerusalem, and he expected to see that one thing that they had been longing to see forever. You know what it was? The temple. And so John trying to figure out what this city is, looks for the temple. And he says, I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Jesus in the gospel is the culmination of the promise of this temple. So when the psalmist writes, how I long to just see those colonnades, to walk into this space and to feel the singing, to hear and to express the, the joy and the worship and to offer the sacrifice and know that God is with us. And then God showed up in his full presence. As Jesus proclaimed, nobody comes to the Father except through me. 
And in his body and in his blood, he offers the true sacrifice for sins. So that not only is he the temple, the place where we meet God, he's also the sacrifice that brings us to God and makes us holy. And then, wherever Jesus is, we're with the presence of God. And I'm telling you that because it's really awesome when he promises in Matthew, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. Which means we don't have to go to Jerusalem, we don't have to go to the temple, because Jesus is here today. And he's in your homes as you worship, as you fellowship, as you love one another. And he promises to be with you wherever you go. Like having your family all the time, living under the same roof. Maybe that doesn't sound like a blessing. It is. Now, there's one other thing that I want to talk about. There's, there's some wonderful parts of the psalm. Psalm uh, 84, verse 10 says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And I want you guys to think about all the places you've been this summer. All the, the plans that you have to go to all the different places. Is there any other place than with Jesus where you actually know peace and joy and rest for your souls? I promise you there is not. And the Psalm 84 says, One day... In your courts, I would trade a thousand elsewhere. I don't care if you're going to all the national parks, if you're gazing on the beauty of Niagara Falls, if you're staring at the expanse of the Sahara Desert or oceans or tropical forests, rainforests, and all the magical and wonderful creature, uh, creatures of this world. I don't care. I'll trade a thousand of those days just for one. Because if I don't have you, I've got nothing. And to be with you is like going home. I'd rather be the doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. I'd rather be the guy who has to sit at the wall and watch and let people know so-and-so's coming in, so-and-so's going out. I'd rather do that stinky, sorry, I forgot there's kids in the room, stinky job then get to rest and take comfort and and reside back in the tent. I'd rather have the smallest position in your house than the greatest position in a house of wickedness. Because it's better to be one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. And that's the other beautiful piece of this psalm that I want to teach you about this morning. And then I'll be done. So every four years we moved because my dad was in federal law enforcement. And that worked out wonderfully for me because uh, in four years I had enough time to do enough embarrassing things that kids would pick on me (laughs) and make fun of me. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to leave and all those stories I'm going to forget and all the cool stories I'm going to tell. So that that way when I showed up to school, I could keep moving up like the social ladder because there's something very important that's about to unfold as soon as you get back into school. It's like the most important piece of the whole thing. Where am I going to sit at lunch. Who am I going to sit with? Who is going to have a space for me? Where am I going to be worthy to find friends and to make connections and to be known as an individual? I never made it to the cool table until seminary. It's a very small pond. I never made it in actual school. But I'd move to different groups and I'd move up. I wish looking back that I would have found a group of people that helped me become the person I wanted to be rather than help me connect to the people I wanted to be associated with. That's something worth thinking about. But have you ever felt like, yeah, it's great to be in the presence of God. It's great to come in for worship and be with the body of Christ. But you know what? I just don't even feel like there's a place for me. I know that's hard in a Lutheran church where everybody has their pew but to feel like, I don't know where I belong. I don't know if this is my place or if I belong someplace else. You say it's better to be in your court, in his courts. I say, why is it even for me? Those courts, the temple had the inside place, and the inside was where the high priest would go, the holy of holies, and it would be a Levite, then an Aaronite, then a uh, Zodokite who would go in there and do that. Those are the different priestly 
uh, groups. And only one guy could go in and offer sacrifice. Nobody else was allowed in there. Then they had the inner court where they could offer sacrifice and the men of the Jews could go in and offer sacrifice. Then they had the bigger outer court where all the Gentiles would come in from all over the place who believed in God and the ladies would come in there as well and, and some of the poor, unstanding, savory people in the, in the city would be allowed just in that outer side. And you wonder, maybe I don't even belong in any of those spots. Am I even worthy to be in the presence of God? Do I have a place at his table? In Psalm 84, verses 3 and 4, as he says, Better is one day in your court than a thousand elsewhere. I long to see your courts. He, remi- he remembers the sparrow. He remembers the swallow. He says, Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a rest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, A sparrow is sold but for two pennies, hardly worth anything. But the psalmist says, you know, and and this is a little different than like Notre Dame and the building of that and all. This structure had little cracks and crevices and all the corners and all the spaces. And the psalmist looks up and says, Not only is there space for the priests and for the people, and for the outsiders. But look, even those worthless little birds have a place here. And they know that they can come here and find rest and find a home and they can raise their young and they can be in the presence of God. What a blessing to dwell in your house and to sing your praise forever. Know that to be with Christ is home. And it's better than anything else this world has to offer. And second, know that if there's place for the sparrows, God has a place especially for you. For you to grow, for you to live, for you to raise your families, and for you to sing praise. That Christ would hear praise, honor, and glory from all people all tribes, all tongues, all nations, from all the generations, and that he would hear that praise even from his creation as the birds sing out his glory and his praise. Let's sing together. There's an old song, an old worship song that Brittany's going to lead us in this morning that we'll continue our worship with.
better is one day. Better is Please one rise. day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. flesh cry out for you the living God your spirit's water to my soul I've tasted and I've seen come once again to me I will draw near to you I will draw near just sang and the right side of the room is going to follow me with the chorus here we go better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts thousands elsewhere better is one day in your courts better is one time we'll continue with the gathering of our tithes and our offerings. I invite you, if this is your first time to St. Luke's, you're going to see some, looks like gentlemen, and probably some ladies outside, but they're wearing the blue lanyard. You can go out and uh, give your welcome card, which you'll find in your pew to them, and they'll give you a welcome bag to take home with some information and a little gift from St. Luke's to encourage you on your journey. If this is your second or any other time after that, and you have any questions or comments, things you'd like to find answers and ways to move forward, you can fill out that welcome card and leave that in the bag as it comes along, and I'll email you this week and answer any questions you might have.
worthy. me qualified to be a pastor is not like the training and the 
proper call and all that kind of stuff. It's that I am the chief among sinners, which makes me particularly educated in knowing where to find forgiveness. I'm telling you that because on many Sundays, um, I tell you my own experience. On Friday, um, I was done. I was strung out, not from drugs. Um, and I took my daughter to the dentist. We had to do cavities, which she'd been a easily uh, successful at before, and this time she caught her eye on the needle. Uh, she freaked out. She wouldn't listen to me. She wouldn't listen to the doc, the dentist, so we were cleaning up. She begged for one more try. She still couldn't do it, and I was so mad, and I was so empty and so disappointed that as we were leaving, she was looking for love like she wanted to hold my hand and I couldn't let her do it. I was so mad. And I realized that who I was and this sin that I was carrying, this habitual thing of just being where I was at was separating me from everyone who I loved and I was losing control and I was losing sense of who I was and my ability to love the people around me. And I realized what that sin cost one of the best chapters in the scriptures is Isaiah 59. I'm going to read for you. As you can think through those sins and those habitual things that separate you from the people you love and you hold dear and make you lose control, I'm going to read Isaiah 59, verse 2 and 3. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. I think oftentimes we don't realize the cost of our sin. That it separates us from our God and it separates us from the people that we love. Praise be to Jesus that he's offered us this morning as he does every day. For great is his faithfulness to bring those cares and those hurts to his table and to leave them there. So take just a second, close your eyes, bow your heads, pray, and leave those things with Jesus. first 13 verses of Isaiah 59 lays out all the terror of our sin. By verse 14, he says, uh, justice is turned back. Righteousness stands far away because of their iniquity. It doesn't even enter into the conversation in the public squares. Truth is lagging. Who departs evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it. it displeased him that there was no justice in the land. And then verse 16 says, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation. His own righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal. According to their deeds, he would repay and he would be the redeemer who would come to Zion and to Jacob and turn them from their transgressions. He didn't come in the way that we expected with sword and shield, with strength to turn over our enemies. But on the very night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So that no matter what might happen, because he worked salvation for us. We would never be hidden from God's sight and never be left from his presence. As you come to this table to receive forgiveness of sins in the body and blood of Christ, know that Christ is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And he has worked salvation on your behalf and is making you whole.
and bringing love to you and your family. Would you lift that up? Take and eat the body of Christ, given for the forgiveness of your sins, and the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of sins. Take and eat the body of Christ, given for the forgiveness of your sins. As they make their way down, I invite you to make two rows, one on each side, and come forward as you're ready to receive the forgiveness of sins in the body of Christ. Take and eat the body of Christ, given on Calvary for the forgiveness of sins. Take and eat the body of Christ, given for the forgiveness of your sins. The Lord bless your coming in and going out. of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of Christ, <coughs> given on Calvary for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and eat the body of Christ, given on Calvary for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and eat the body of Christ, given on Calvary for the forgiveness of your sins. i 
sweeter when Jesus says to his mother, behold, I go to make all things new. That is the promise in which we live, we worship, and we go out from this place. Please rise. Would you pray with me? Asking the Lord to be faithful in this world, in our relationships, and the people we carry on our hearts and our minds. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you this day that we've come into this place, into your presence, not by bricks and mortar, but by being with your body, the church. For you promise where two or three are gathered under your name, you are with us. That you are speaking tenderly in our ear. This is the way, walk in it. That you are bringing restoration. You are bringing us out of a place of wickedness and into a place of peace in your presence. In that hope, we pray. We pray for strength for those who are hurting, those who are weak in spirit, physically. We pray that you'd bring them comfort, that you'd mount them up on wings of eagles because they wait on you. Lord, we ask for those who are celebrating. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness and life and love and, and the joys that this life can bring because of your providence and your gift. Lord, in all these things, throughout the world, throughout all circumstances, we ask that you'd be ever present and that your will would be done because it's good, it's perfect, it's pleasing. No, we don't always understand it, we trust it. We ask that you'd, even through the summer and the Psalms and through the rest of this year, continue to draw us to yourself, that we would learn what it is to abide because we are your beings, not just here for doing. And that our identities would be swelled up and identified and founded in you that you would show us who we are because of what you've done for us and how you've loved us. That we might share that love with everyone we meet. We ask these things according to the blessings we have in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As you go from this place, go in the peace of knowing that Christ goes with you. Go in the joy of knowing that he is leading the way. And go in the strength because you know he will carry you no matter what the trials may come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>